Hebrews chapter 12, let's look at verses 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does see easily beset us, and let us run with patience that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Christianity is not necessarily a sprint to the finish line, but rather it's a marathon. There are so many in our world today that are getting all wrapped up in who gets there first. Nobody remembers those that came in second, those who came in third, but they always remember who came in first. So that's our biggest goal is to try to get there first. But really, everyone who runs to the end is a winner. Everyone that gets to the finish line is successful. This morning we're interested in winning the Christian race as we run this Christian race. It's not enough to just begin the race, but to want to complete the race. And no doubt there are many hardships, there are many hurdles, there are many heartaches that we might face along the way. But again, to remember that this is a marathon and that we are in it for the long haul, come what may. This morning, I want us to look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And there are three main points that I want to put before you. First of all, I want us to think what the writer is encouraging us to do, and that's to look back. And that is to look back to the saints of old. That means we have to go back to Hebrews chapter 11. But listen to what he says in Hebrews 11 in verse 1 there. Or verse 12 in verse 1 when he says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Who is he referring to? Those in Hebrews chapter 11. Those individuals. Those who by faith did what they did. Men and women who lived by faith, their lives were adorned by the faithfulness to God. And no doubt they had many hardships. They had many hurdles and heartaches even back then. You know, when you think about these great men and women who lived in those uh, times, they, they lived by faith. Notice Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. You see, faith gives substance and reality to the things that are not seen. There is a thread that, that really runs through the lives of every person that is listed here in chapter 11. And that thread is faith. Now Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 7 that we walk by faith and not by sight. And now we also understand that to, in order to walk by faith, they know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So one of the characters that's not specifically named here, but his labors are mentioned in chapter 11, that's Joshua. Do you remember Joshua, Joshua 1, when God had made this statement that Moses, my servant, is dead? That God then said to Joshua in verse 8, That this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Notice this statement. For then thou shalt make thy way, thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. You know why these people were prosperous? Do you know why they, they were successful in their lives? It's all because they lived by faith. 
You could begin by talking about Abel, a man that worshiped God there in verse 4, and he did it by faith. Then Enoch, a man who was translated, a man who did not see death. And we think about his walk of faith there in verse 5. There is Noah, a man who worked by faith, instructed by Almighty God to build an ark to the saving of his household, of which he did and ultimately became the heir of righteousness, which is according to, here it is, faith. Verse 7. And then what about Abraham there in verse 8? where Abraham was instructed to go out to a place which he knew not, yet the Bible says he obeyed. I think about the ways of faith. Not just Abraham, but then also the life of Moses. Moses saw him who was invisible. He looked for that reward. And so here are individuals that live by faith. Their lives were adorned by faith. But then there's also a second thing I want you to see. And that it's not only their faith, but their fortitude. There are two things that we can see here in the latter part of chapter 11. First of all, I want you to consider the obstacles of faith. Since the first of the year... Have we not seen difficulties in our lives? Have we not seen some of the trials and the tribulations and the temptations that have come our way just since the first of the year? Yes. Have you ever felt like just giving up, throwing in the towel? Maybe you haven't, but I know some have. And in fact, some gave in. They gave up. And they're no longer with us because of that. Well, take a look at Hebrews 11, verse 32. Here specifically, he's going to talk about those obstacles that they faced, but then they were overcomers by faith as well. Look at verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson, of Japheth, of David also and Samuel and other prophets. But listen to this statement, verse 33. I think this is the key here. Who through faith. That's it. If you want to be able to overcome the obstacles of life, then you've got to rely on one faith. The Hebrew writer continued to say, who through faith, listen to what they did, they subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in faith, it, uh, turned to, in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection, and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with a sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, verse 39. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, there's that idea again, they received not the promise Or they received not the promise that God having provided some better thing for us. That they without us should not be made perfect. Were these people resilient? Yes. There there was some sense of resolve here as they faced these adversities. These obstacles of faith and these trials in their lives. Yes. But through faith they were victorious. They were victorious. So when you look back and you think about all the great saints of God, one of the great things about the Old Testament is that there are so many men and women who lived their lives that were worthy of emulation. Emulation. I really believe that we can draw strength by going back and looking at that history and reading about these resilient saints. 
To think of just how they faced great odds, how they engaged, engaged in battles, and yet time and again, they did it by faith. The scriptures make it very plain that they were victorious. Paul would say in Romans 15 and verse 4 that those things that were written aforetime were written for our learning, right? And that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And I could probably finish that ellipsis, have hope for ourselves, right? Have you ever felt like the situation that you're facing is hopeless in life? You read about the exploits of some of these men and these women, and you think about the hopelessness that they have faced, and yet through faith, faith, they were able to overcome. But then number two, we look back, and then we secondly, we're encouraged to look up to the Savior. Listen again to what the writer says in Hebrews 12 and verse 1 when he said, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Notice verse 2. Looking unto Jesus. He's the Savior. Yes, we are to look back to those saints, but now we're instructed to look up to Jesus, our Savior, who is identified by the writer in verse 2 as the author and the finisher of our faith, the perfecter, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then in verse 3, he said, for for consider him that endured such contradiction or hostility of sinners against himself. Let's talk about the task of Jesus. The writer begins to, to bring to our mind the cross where Jesus came to this earth to die on the cross. Back in chapter 10 of Hebrews, the Hebrew writer talks about the very work of Christ. He really goes back to the Old Testament. He talks about the prophecies that were given concerning the, com- the coming of the Messiah. And in reference to Christ, Hebrews 10 and verse 7, he would make this statement. Then said, Lo, or then said, I, lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written of me to do thy will, O God. What was that will? The will that God had devised a plan before the world began to redeem the human family through through his son, Jesus Christ. Now Peter tells us, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. 1 Peter 1.20 Jesus Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, according to Revelation 13 and verse 8. You see, God had decreed that, the, that his redemptive plan would rest on the shoulders of his very son, Christ Jesus. And so the task before him was enormous. And you can read of the struggles that Jesus faced as he went to the cross. But I think about the Son of God coming to fulfill the will of Almighty God, His Father. But listen to Jesus in Luke 19.10 when He said that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Lord Jesus came to fulfill heaven's plan. That plan to redeem us from all iniquity, as Paul would say in Titus in verse 2. Now then, we come to the trials of Jesus. We saw the task. But think about the trials that he experienced in his life. Look back again at verse 2, where the Bible says, of, of Hebrews 12, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For in verse 3, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. What about the treatment that Jesus received here on planet Earth? John tells us 
that he came unto his own and his own received him not. He wasn't very well received even by his own brethren, his own people, John 1.11. But look at the trial of Jesus. He had been betrayed into the hands of the Jews by the Roman authorities. One of his own sold him out for, for 30 pieces of silver. The Bible talks about how Jesus was scourged, that they spat upon him and they slapped and they ridiculed and they mocked him. And then they took him out to Golgotha, Calvary. And Luke said it was there that they crucified him and the malefactors. One on the right hand and one on the left. Luke 23, 33. To talk about the ill treatment of the very Son of God. To try to somehow wrap our minds some, somehow around the fact that as Peter had said, who is his own self bear our sins in his own body on the cross. 1 Peter 2, 24. Can you even imagine being nailed to a cross, writhing in pain, trying to gasp for breath after breath after breath, to have people standing at the very foot of the cross, railing at you, blaspheming you, your name, saying you saved others, but you, yourself you cannot save. That if you are the Christ, why don't you come down from the cross? Then we will believe. I'll tell you what. If Jesus would have came off of that cross right then, nobody would have believed him. No one. Let me tell you what. Jesus was the creator. He then was the agent by which the world was made. And he suffered at the hands of his own creation. But he did so mightily. Willingly. I think about the statement of Jesus, the treatment of Jesus, I meant. But then there's the second thing, and that's the thrill of Jesus. What was it that held him on that cross? Now, we might think it was those nails. We might think it was the nails that, that Jesus experienced. We might think that it was Jesus experienced that trial, that it was the mockery of the child, trials. Think about Jesus having people, people slap him in the head, spit in his face, rail at him, pulling on his beard. And he endured all that. And the Hebrew writer here says that Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame. Did you know that Jesus Christ would go to the cross and he would experience Golgotha? the full weight of Golgotha, because of the thrill, the joy of knowing that you and I could be saved. That's right. Did you know that the Lord Jesus went to the cross with you in mind? Jeremiah the prophet in Jeremiah 1 and verse 5, where God said to Jeremiah, before I formed thee, in the belly I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. I want you to think about the omniscience of God. The fact that God is all-knowing. And think that the very Son of God would go to the cross with joy on my behalf. On your behalf. And to think that folks will reject him, to laugh and ridicule him. And yet to know that Jesus died for us. He endured the cross, despising the shame. And as the writer said, who for the joy that was set before him. Jesus went to the cross with joy in his heart. Joy because his blood was the remedy for our sins. There's something else I want you to see, and that's the tenacity of Jesus. One of the great things about our Lord Jesus Christ is that he wasn't a quitter. He wasn't a quitter. There are a lot of things and a lot of folks out there that just quit. They just throw their hands up and say, I give up. I don't know what else. If the Lord Jesus Christ had quitted, 
or if he had quit, where would we be? Or we would be lost. We would be, as Paul said, having no hope and without God in this world, Ephesians 2.12. Christ Jesus willingly, submissively, and humbly went to the cross for us. So when I think about the tenacity of Jesus, I think about somebody who, number one, did not give in. You go back to the Garden of Gethsemane. Here we remember in Matthew 26, 36 through 46, where Matthew records Jesus being in the garden. And he had taken Peter, James, and John with him. And he had gone there to pray because he knew that the cross was was ever before him. And so in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus bows his head in the presence of God the Father, and Matthew says three times Jesus prayed to, the, to God the Father, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Verse 39. Now, it's interesting that Luke tells us in his account that Jesus prayed in agony. Luke twenty two forty four, where Luke said, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat sweat were, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. The Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews 5 and verse 7, lending insight into the pain that Jesus experienced in the garden. He said, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. When I think about Jesus in the garden praying to God the Father and asking, is there any other way? Please, please let it come to pass. Think about it. In agony, praying to God the Father with tears. And yet the answer was no. There's no other way, son. Could Jesus have given in? Could Jesus have thrown in the towel? Yes. He was human. He could have just said, I, God, I just can't do this. But he didn't. He had that prerogative. He could have walked away. And I'm convinced that the real weight of the cross was the fact that Jesus understood that for a period of time, there would be a separation between him and God the Father. You remember on the cross when Jesus had cried out, cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means God, or uh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus is praying earnestly in the garden, but he didn't give in, nor did he give up. You know, a lot of times folks give up. And I'll probably be the first one to admit the easiest thing to do at times in life is just to give up, to give in. But look again at what the text says in verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. Notice this next word, endured. That's the key word, endured. He persevered the cross despising the shame set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Aren't you grateful? Aren't you grateful that Jesus Christ didn't give in and didn't give up? I am. And the Hebrew writer here is writing to Hebrew Christians, many of whom were on the brink of going back to Judaism. Some had already gone back. Others were on the brink of going back. And the writer says, look, Whatever you do, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give in and don't give out. Why? Because there is a better place. There is a better place. There is something far better. In light of the fact that there is this tendency among some to give up, I would encourage you to look back at the saints that we read about there, and then I want you to look up to the Savior as well. Number three. There's also an encouragement for us to look in to self. 
to look in. Go back to what was said beginning in verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin would thus so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now look at verse 3. He said, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. There's a key here for us. And that key is, if we want to enjoy the victory, that the saints in days gone by have enjoyed, we must endure, we must persevere. We must persevere. We need the attitude that we are in this thing till the end, right? That we're not going to give up. In no way, under any circumstance, are we going to throw in the towel and say that it's not worth it. I would encourage us to take the long view of things. You know, I mentioned a moment ago about Moses, right? Moses was a great man. Moses had the treasures of Egypt at his fingertips. He did. But I want you to notice in Hebrews 11 and verse 25 and 26 of how choosing Moses, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Here's the reason why. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. If you're ever tempted to give up, you need to think about the reward. There's something far better than this world. You need to think about the reward and to ask the question, is it worth it? I would encourage you to read passages like Revelation 21, John 14, 1 Peter 1. Passages that remind us of the great blessings that we have in Christ and the hope that we have for a better life beyond this bell of tears. Here's some encumbrances of faith that we face in this life. And the writer here talks about them. First, he mentions how we are to lay aside every weight. Sometimes our vision becomes obstructed in life because of what's going on. If we're not careful, we're going to allow the various weights of life to pose a threat in our relationship to the Lord. Sometimes it's just the simple mundane things of life. For example, we can get so busy in our job, in our school, and other activities outside the home that we get so caught up in our hobbies and our, our interests. We get so focused on this and that. And before you know it, what happens to our Christianity? Well, we ain't got time for it. We've, we've, it's easier for us to push God to the side and say, you know, when I get older, I'll start thinking about those things. You might not get to see older, right? We get so caught up in those things. Sometimes we allow the things of life to obstruct our vision of what's really important. And so the writer here is saying, what you need to do is to discard those weights. Anything that would come between you and your relationship with your Lord, you need to get rid of it. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33? He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. When are we to do that? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then he'll take care of you as long as you do that. It's possible that sometimes as Christians that we get so caught up in life that the Lord Jesus Christ gets only a slice of the pie rather than the whole pie. The Lord wants the whole pie. He wants our whole lives. He's not interested in just a piece of life. He wants everything. Why? Because he owns you. Lock, stock, and barrel. Everything you have belongs to him. And so he wants the entirety of your life. But then there's a second thing. He said, and the sin which so easily besets or snares us. That has to do with wickedness and waywardness. You know, sometimes sin 
can so easily beset us to the point of being wearied and faint in this life, verse 3. That is the weaknesses that we have in this life, isn't it? Are there things that you battle day in and day out? Those nuances that just continues to raise their ugly head in your life sometimes? Yes. You overcome today and tomorrow you're back at it and you're facing the same old besetting sin. And you give in, see? And then the next day comes around, you continue trying to win that battle, but you continue to lose the battle. You see, what's the tendency here? To give up. To give up. Some folks say, I, I can't make it. I can't live this Christian life. You're expecting too much out of me. Have you heard that? I have. Oh, God's expecting too much out of us if it's going to dictate in such a way like that. No. There are rules and regulations, and God has provided that for us. And they're simple, but it's up to us to abide by it. Well, you see, the reason why you would think this way, that, well, I can't, I can't live that Christian life, and, and I can't go by those dictates, and I can't, I, you know, it's just suspecting too much. That's the devil. That's the devil putting that into your mind to make you think that. Because the devil knows he don't want you with God. And so if he can put that into your mind that well, there's no way, Christianity is too hard, you can't do it. You see, he put that in your mind. That's what the devil wants you to think. He wants you to feel like it's hopeless. And so here the writer is saying, number one, that you need to lay aside those weights, those things that abstract you, that pull you down. Then you need to lay aside wickedness, that is sin, anything that would be a defilement in life. And then he talks about those who have forsaken the right way. Then link to that weariness. Look at verse 3 again. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint or discouraged in your minds. You know, it's so easy to get discouraged, isn't it? It's so easy to get weary sometimes. Some folks have to face debilitating, debilitating illnesses and diseases. Look what we've been dealing with for these past weeks, two months now almost, of this COVID-19 virus. We're getting to the point of becoming just tired. Tired. We're not watching the news anymore. We're getting weary. We're just like the other diseases. It's just a fight day in and day out. What's the difference? I know so many have come to the conclusion, you know what, I'm ready to get out of here. So many have taken their lives over this thing. Afraid that they're not going to get over it. Afraid they're going to get it. So many others have been fighting cancer, old age, heart disease, and others to the point of not eating anymore. They've given up and ready to get out. You see, sometimes as Christians in the heat of the battle and after we've been pounded day after day after day, we feel like just giving up because that's the only way out. But there is a way. There is a way. The writer here is talking to Christians. And sometimes as members of the body of Christ, we can become discouraged and weary in our souls. Sometimes folks even have problems in the church. I'm not sure that if there are any greater problems than problems that happen to God's people within the body. Sometimes you just feel like walking away. I, I remember many, many years ago going through some difficulties and for a period of time, I was ready just to walk away. I've had enough. I've had many preacher friends who had just done just that. They walked away. No longer preaching anymore. And I, and I wonder why. They can preach better than I can. And they walked away. I was so discouraged. I was so hurt. Maybe even angry. That I felt like quitting and walking away. I'm not saying I'm anything special. Because I'm not. But you see. If I had quit. The devil would have won. The devil would have won. And that's what the devil's all about. He wants you to quit. He wanted me to quit. He probably wants me to quit now. 
but I'm not ready to quit. I'm just getting started, right? He doesn't care how you become weary with Christianity. He doesn't care how you become discouraged. He just wants you to quit. And all of these tools are at his disposal and and he will use them effectively. Here are two things that will help us to endure and ride out that storm and overcome. We need to lean on the safe arms of Jesus. Hebrews 2 and verse 18. The Bible talks about Jesus and it says, For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Can we not cast our cares upon him? Can we not go before the throne of God and acknowledge our weaknesses, our shortcomings, our weariness, our discouragements in this life? To be honest and candid with ourselves, to ask for help? Yes. And then secondly, I would encourage you to lean on the scriptures as well. The scriptures will encourage. When you get down in the valley of discouragement and despair, I want, you to, encourage, I want to encourage you to go back. I want you to read the book of Psalms. Read it over and over and over again. David talks about being down in the valley of the shadow of death. But there's going to be valleys. There's going to be mountains. There's going to be peaks. And when David was in the valley, I can hear David saying in the long ago, this, I know God is with me or for me. God will be with you day in and day out. That's what God said to Joshua in the long ago when Joshua took the mantle of leadership. When he assumed the reins of leadership over the nation of Israel, God said, I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Joshua 1 and verse 5. That same promise is valid even today. If you go to Hebrews 13 and verse 5, he said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. There's a story about an interesting lady from Kenya. She was a marathoner. And she was running in a marathon in Austin, Texas. And for 23 miles in, this young lady was in the lead. She's in the lead. And for whatever reason, she begins to falter. Exhaustion sets in. And as she gets to the last mile of the race, she falls to the ground. The reports that were given about this lady was that she crawled on all fours to the finish line. She came in third. But she crawled on all fours, her hands and her knees. Sometimes as Christians... We're running the Christian race. Sometimes we're walking and sometimes we've been beaten down to the point where where we are on all fours and we're just trying to crawl to the finish line. What an inspiration that this lady was to so many people. Interesting story. You talk about somebody that had some grit and grime about them. That lady had some grit and grime. Here she is on all fours crawling to the finish line. The Bible tells us that heaven is out before us. You see, what the devil wants is you to quit. He wants you to say, I've had enough. You need to say, you know what? I'm not quitting. I'm not quitting. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to give out and I'm not going to give up. I'm in this thing for the long haul. And so if you're here and not a Christian... Or if you're listening to us on live stream, you're not a Christian. Can we encourage you to become one? You see, God has provided a way of escape from those things that are in our lives that has been such a problem because that's what the devil has given us. There is a far better place. There's a, a better, there's a way out. There's a, an escape. And God has given us that. And if you're not a Christian, then all you have to do is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon your belief to repent of those sins, to turn away from them, to make that good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, to then put the Lord on in baptism for the remission of your sins. He provided that for us. And then the Lord will then add you to His church, His body, of which Jesus is the head. 
I hope that you'll make that decision. I hope that you'll call us, you'll write us, you'll text us, you'll whatever. Let us know so that we can help you in everything.